Listen. I spent my whole damn life in the city. Anywhere I go, DC's coming with me. I spent my whole damn life in the city. I can go for broke, but the capital is in me. I spent my whole damn life in the city. Anywhere I go, DC's coming with me. I spent my whole damn life in the city. I can go for broke, but the capital is in me. Welcome, everyone, to District Divided, a DC sports podcast. I am Amit. That is KDOT. KDOT, how are you doing today, sir? I am doing very well. Once again, hashtag Yacht Bitch. Hashtag Yacht Bitch. Hey, that's been spreading like wildfire in our friend groups over here. Every chat has Yacht Bitch going right now. Yacht Bitch. Yacht Bitch. Shout out. It's going to catch on. Welcome back stateside, buddy. Um, This episode is going to be a bit of an emotional one. We traded away the Washington Nationals, a 23-year-old generational talent by the name of Juan Soto. I can't even speak properly. Uh, He is now a San Diego Padre. We got a number of players back, and frankly, I still haven't checked who all we got back. I'm just going to keep it real with you because I don't care right now. It's still very raw for me, still very emotional. We're going to talk about Juan Soto and trading him away. Um, Then we're going to talk about Commander's Training Camp. Uh, We are mainly a Commander-centric show Still can't talk, <laughs> so we're going to get into that, and we'll get into the comment mailbag after that, along with after the pod, as we always do. But we got to begin, of course, with Juan Soto. 23-year-old Dominican sensation is now a San Diego Padre. He has joined a pretty cool lineup over there, admittedly, from the neutral baseball perspective. Manny Machado, you've got Fernando Tatis. Like, you know, they've got some guys. Um, but for the Nationals... KDOT, we just traded away the crown jewel of the organization and potentially in all of baseball. Yeah. What were your thoughts on the trade? How are you feeling? Like, this is almost just a therapy session. Like, how are you? I have never been more irate on a transaction by any team I follow than this one. I was beside myself in anger. Um, especially so close to the fucking trade deadline. Like I had a, I was feeling, oh, we might, we might be able to get. Look, man, I'm out. I'm out on the next. I, I, I'll announce this right now. I'm out. I'm out until the learners sell the team. Um, the vibe I get right now, following this organization, following this team, is you have a family that bought the cheapest fuck Montreal Expos for $250 million back in 2004, 2005. Move them in the RFK. You know how many games I went to with the concrete fucking falling off of pillars around me um, early on? And now they have an opportunity to sell this team for $2 billion. And they, they, I think that this has been the entire goal from day one. They cosplayed as the... Boston Red Sox and New York Yankees for two or three seasons to bump payroll up to get the World Series. And after they've done that, they've been selling the farm in order to make as much money as humanly possible on the sell of the fucking team, which means they're not invested in the community. They're not invested in the team. They're not invested in the fans. They're not invested in any of that shit other than lining their pockets. That's their prerogative. I'm not feeding any more into the bullshit. I'm just not. I can't. I can barely name any of the fucking players on the team. Strasburg is never fucking healthy. Patrick Corbin. I guess it's the only guy I can go do, and he's he's been Patrick Corbin this goddamn year. Like it's. What am I holding my hat on with this organization, this team? You look at the 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 world champions. We are the world champions three years ago. How many guys from that championship team are still here? Thanks, like, Robles. What the fuck? Like you, it's clear as day. They want to maximize profit on the sell of the team. That's it. That's the only thing they care about. We went from cosplaying as the Yankees or the the Red Sox for for a few seasons, which got us results, to then being Billy Bean in the fucking Oakland A's overnight. Like, what are you doing? And you you saw it like every time that they would trade somebody, it was all well, we have to trade this guy in order to pay these guys, and this is what we're gonna do. We get these prospects. Right now, with the status quo, as soon as they're worth a damn, we're going to trade them too. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. We're we're not the we're not we're not the Oakland A's. We're Washington. We're Washington D.C. 
We are not some small market farm system bullshit team. That's not who we are. We have the ability to be one of the best, one of the biggest fucking franchises. You see our market? And I get the whole Masson thing and fuck Peter Angelos and all that shit. But we have the ability here in this town. You saw on that World Series run, there was no liver fucking stadium than that part. We yeah. can do this. We're just, they're choosing not to. And they need to sell the team. They have to sell this fucking team as fast as humanly possible to get us somebody in here that understands what the franchise could be. So I think you put that perfectly in. I'm going to try and be measured, but we'll see. In baseball, ownership is incredibly, incredibly important because there's no salary cap. So if you have money and you're willing to spend it, you have every opportunity to be really, really good. In this case, we know the following. We know the owners don't want to be here, right? That That mm-hmm. is the most important thing is we know the owners don't want to be here. What else do we know? We know Juan Soto has two and a half years left on his deal. We know that the same owners that don't want to be here offered him 15 years, $440 million. That was the most in baseball, yes, but on AAV, average annual value, 20th highest for what everyone in baseball agrees is a generational talent. And one that won you a World Series alongside Anthony Rendon, who was shipped off because we had to pay Juan Soto, alongside Trey Turner, who was shipped off because we had to pay Juan Soto, Alongside Max Scherzer, who we shipped off because we had to pay Juan Soto. There was time for this to be resolved. There was time for this sale to go through to whomever wanted the team. And there was time for that new owner to speak to Scott Boris, to speak to Juan Soto, and to fix this. So... I'm fucking pissed off because the learners made a decision that honestly they should not have made. That was not their decision to make. Right. I get that they're owners right now and they can do it. Um, I get that they were petty in not chartering the flight and yeah, maybe it was paid for whatever for Juan to go to the all-star game and all the festivities. He wins the home run derby anyway. It feels like our hearts just got ripped out for no reason. Like there was no reason for this to happen. And if you read any opinion pieces, they're just saying, everyone is saying, you don't do this. You don't trade a 23-year-old future Hall of Fame talent caliber player. That's exactly what we did. He's got a good 10, 15 years left. And they're going to be played probably in San Diego. I don't think they're making that trade unless they have designs of keeping him, right? So... I don't care who we got back because of what he means to this city. Still at just 23, what he means breaking that duck for us. We had just lost Bryce Harper. The very next year we win. Juan's the darling. Rendon's the darling. They're all gone. It it just feels lifeless, right? There's no point in going to a game. There's no point. If you're casual, I'll admit I'm casual. I'm more of a, you know, bandwagon. Nats fan. I'll be the first to admit it. But this, if it hurts me this much, <laughs> can you imagine like how bad this is for people that have season tickets that go to the games regularly? It was a big fuck you to them. It was a big middle finger and you're not even staying. Speechless after all that. Uh, a lot of words, but ultimately I'm still describing it as speechless because this did not have to happen, Dot. This it, really did not have to happen. It didn't have to happen. And the thing that always is grinding me is that like, I'm more than a casual baseball fan, right? I, I, I love baseball. And, like, I was raised a Yankees fan because fuck Peter Angelos, and I wanted to be able to go. The Yankees were the easiest team to follow. They were always on the news. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I was, like, a front chase, a front runner as far as chasing. I wanted to stick it to Baltimore because fuck Peter Angelos. So it was, like, easy as a kid. And you now live in Baltimore, just to be clear. I live in Baltimore now, and it was I love Camden Yards, but it was uh, the amount of times where they play the Yankees, it was really, really easy to go to Camden Yards and go watch the Yankees play. So that's the team I was raised on. It's actually the team I'm going back to right now because I got to fucking watch some baseball, and I've got to root for somebody, right? Yeah. Um, so 
and I know it seems like a front runner. I get it. I'm not gonna. I, I'll accept your. Criticism. I don't think anyone has a right to fucking judge you right now. Honestly. Look, as soon as the Nats in, in came these, into town, in these I, few days. As soon as the Nats came into yeah. town, like I still respect the Yankees. I was right. I still got all my jerseys, all that shit. But I, I want to root for the home team. Right now, the ownership, and I know how it almost sounds. Look, Dan Snyder is a piece of shit. But the thing with Dan Snyder, even though he's a piece of shit, is that I can always look to the team and be like, at least there are some guys that have been here for five years, ten years, I can root for. Um, at least the team is trying to win. They might be incompetent, but they're trying to win games. Oh, the next Nets- year, if Snyder is owner of the Nets. Oh, it's true. without a doubt. He He's probably overpaid, overpaid too. Right, yeah, right. Exactly. So like, yeah. We're probably all complaining about, why'd you give him a billion dollars, Dan? Like, <laughs> But at least we have him here. But we would have him, right? So like, that's the thing that we got to – it's it's so aggravating. This is a dude that's being compared to Ted Williams and Babe Ruth, and he's gone. He's gone. What? 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 And look, somebody, people can tell me, like, hey, uh, you know, this might be better in the team in the long run. Maybe. I don't know, five years from now. But, look, if we are on the status quo, these guys will never – they might be all-stars to watch them but come around that second contract – Gone, 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 gone. And all these fans, the, the ones that do go to every game, the ones that are constantly defending the fucking learners right now, and now trying to blame Juan Soto, which is the most ridiculous thing I've seen. Can't blame him. How dare you blame Juan Soto? The, the, how lost in the sauce are you that you blame Juan Soto or that you're defending the learners in this position that they're taking on this? But. Everybody going to talk about, well, you know, you got to rebuild the farm, so you got to look at the analytics, you got to do this, and yet you have to do those things, but you also have to be willing to spend fucking money. You know my favorite part about the movie Moneyball? You see Moneyball, right? Of you course, all see Moneyball. Great movie. Yeah, yeah. Favorite part about the movie Moneyball is at the end where they let you know that Billy Bean still hasn't fucking won a championship in Oakland, right? What right. did they, what the Red Sox do? And fuck the Red Sox. But what they do? They're like, that's a smart idea. We're going to couple that with spending money. And that's what you have to do. You look right. at the Mets right now. Who fucking shirt? I still watch the Mets and Scherzer and want to cry every time he's on the mound, right? Because Scherzer is my favorite guy. Love Max Scherzer, right? Steve Cohen knows what he's doing. I have to spend money. You have to. The learners and all your fucking dead ass malls that you got. All around fucking ghost town malls and White Flint and fucking Wheaton and all this bullshit. All you're trying to do is make a fucking buck. That's it. Fuck off. And look, I know I'm emotional right now, but you're it's your fault, fucking learners. And yeah. look, I and here's and I'll say this through everything. I will forever be grateful for you guys bringing a team to my city. I am forever grateful for. One of the highlights of my entire life, seeing them win that World Series. Forever grateful. And can still say, fuck you for doing this. Oh, things can be true. Absolutely. Because that's all I've wanted to say, too. It's just, fuck the learners. Again, there was time. It's one thing if Juan, if this was his last year in his deal, and it was quite clear he wasn't going to re-sign. Then you go, clear. okay, fine. But when Juan Soto comes out and goes, honestly, I didn't think I was going to get dealt. I I thought they were not serious about that. Well, it sounds like there was a lot of fucking time to figure that out. Right. And it should be the fans and people that matter. And time and time again, we're seeing this just not the case with some of these owners, but some of them to their credit. Absolutely. It does. Uh, But for others like the learners in this situation, doesn't. It wasn't their decision to make is the way that I feel about it in a sense. And we I don't think it's a fa- completely, but it's, it's the decision of the new owner. If you already know that your foot's out the door, right? It's like having a house that you know, you're going to sell. So are you going to do trash it before the other guy comes? Are you going to strip yeah. all the copper pipes and shit out of the fucking thing? It's a good analogy. Like, it's all right. Well, I'm going to sell this thing. I'm not going to fucking custom paint the walls, whatever it is I want. I've got to make it as best as I can for the next guy coming up. So in the conversations that you're having, you find out, okay, hey guys, um, so we got this Juan Soto guy. He's got two years left in this contract. And anybody that comes in here, if they sell the team before the end of the year, gets to then make the decision on what to do with Juan Soto. He'll forever be tradable. There's never going to be a position where he's not tradable. And, and you're not going to be able to get a huge return on him. 
But even from the learner's perspective, this almost felt vindictive because if they leave it up to the new owner and the new owner decides to trade or, you know, yeah, just trade one, well, it's not the learner's fault anymore, right? They still make their money. It's not their fault. The house is cleaner, right? Until that other owner decides. And if there's another owner that's interested, that wants to spend the money, well, now we have one and we can have other guys. So maybe that's where they're coming from. They were fearful another owner would resign Juan Soto, would bring more people and would bring more World Series over here. And they just didn't want to have that. I have no idea because they want their legacy to be, we were the only people to bring a World Series over here. I have no idea. I can't. It doesn't make sense to me that this happened. It's right. it's it's completely illogical, and that's what makes it so upsetting. And completely hearing Mike Rizzo, illogical. who I respect a great yeah. deal, try to spin this. Look, I yeah. will take it. I will take. I will take what Mike Rizzo is saying at face value with this. He didn't think he was going to resign. Do you know why Mike Rizzo is saying that? Because he knows the learners were going to be cheap fucking bastards or try to backload the contract when you actually start getting up to how much he needs to make average per year. That's what was going to happen. Is he knew Scott Boris and those guys, they were never going to give him the contract that he actually deserved. And we've already done the breakdown on how bullshit that contract was that they did give the offer to. Look, yep. biggest contract of all time, bullshit. Like, we understand. And that's what we have to get down to is the only reason it didn't happen is he knew and they knew that if the learners are going to be in control of this team much longer than we expect, which is I'm hoping they sell it tomorrow. But it looks like we're probably a year off from them actually selling this fucking thing. They just knew they were going to be too cheap to do anything about it. Yeah. So we're going to Billy Bean, Oakland A's the fuck out of this thing and ship off anybody that's worth a damn until we get an owner in here that can actually be willing to spend the money to go do something. Uh, and I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that the guys, the prospects that we have line up and they're great and we, we can rebuild and maybe we got another one. I mean, it's almost impossible. Maybe we got another Juan Soto in the waiting. I doubt it, but that's the hope, right? But right now with the way that the learners are treating this team, I'm not, I'm not watching this shit. I'm not. I'm out. No, and you shouldn't. Honestly, it just enables the behavior, frankly. And for those that are like, it's Scott Boris. He's the devil of baseball and stuff like that. Guess what? Other teams work with him. And guess what? He's got all stars on his list. So you better learn to work with him if you want to marry the saber metrics and also spending some money because you need to do that at the end of the day. There yeah. is a certain part of that that needs to happen. Why would you ever blame Scott Boris for doing what's in the best interest of That's his client? His job. His client. Yeah. He, he's supposed to get as much money for his client as possible. And I'm sorry, Juan Soto on the open market is going to command more than the Nats were willing to give. So what do you have to do? You have to make sure that you grease the fuck. You, you got to make sure that he doesn't want to do that. And the yeah. only way you can do it is make a contract offer that makes sure he knows, oh, shit, they're really serious about this. And that's yep. not what that was. It wasn't. Um, and we could go on forever on this, but I think we should switch focus to the gridiron, to the Washington Commanders training camp, which is still ongoing. And we've got ourselves a preseason game, not this Saturday, but next Saturday at 1 p.m., I believe is the time against the Carolina Panthers. Um, and so it's exciting just to see them suit up again. They're in pads. They're going to play a game. Um, KDOT. This past week, though, there's been some interesting bits of news. Uh, what in particular would you like to highlight here? Because there's a there are a lot of places we can go with this. Yeah, uh, from a positive standpoint, Cole Turner looks like the real deal. From what everybody's saying, he's he's well built. But they say the way he's running, the way he's catching, things like that. We actually have somebody that looks like he's going to be worth a damn, which has been a good, 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 good thing to see. Um, the, the Carson Wentz has got good zip on that football. The defense, of course, is ahead of the offense, as is to be expected, but the offense is looking like, all right, we have somebody that can actually get the job done. The the, the comparisons I've heard a lot as far as um, uh, listening to Ref the District, shout out to those guys, love those guys. Shout out. When they had Julie Donaldson on, I think it was Stoner that asked the question as far as how did training camp look any different as far as the quarterback position? And Julie Donaldson answered, and she had a great point, which is that last training camp they had Ryan Fitzpatrick because um, he doesn't go down until, what, week one of the season. So there was this sort of leadership thing. There was you had this command, this guy who was a command of the offense, and it feels like it's a return to that sort of deal. Carson might be, Carson Ryan, just guys that have been veterans, guys that can put zip on the ball, guys can make those throws. 
And there's an excitement level that I think we were at last year when it came to, oh, we really want to see this offense. There are more weapons than we had last year, and we've got a guy who has probably more physical talent than Ryan Fitzpatrick does. So it, it's exciting. The things on the offense seem as though it's exciting, and knowing that that of the two sides of the football, defense or offense, there are a lot more question marks with the offense than we have on the defense. We know what the defense needs to do. Um, outside of those positive things, I guess the negative things to highlight would be the injuries. And that is, they were my darkest timeline last week. Oh, yeah. With how the season goes. I don't like hearing this. This is the only thing you ever want to hear in training camp is that you don't want to hear about injuries, right? You can hear about anything else, the growing pains, whatever. You got to be on the field. <laughs> so yeah. we highlight Cole Turner. He went down this morning as we're uh, recording. So was it a hamstring injury or something? Hamstring confirmed, yeah. Danny Brown, Curtis Samuel have been on the sidelines. It's, that's not good. And I don't want to hear that kind of shit coming out of training camp. That scares me because that can snowball real fast into something that we can't necessarily manage. And we've already lost three players essentially for the season in Antonio Gandy Golden, who retired linebacker, Trey Walker undrafted free agent, but he retired and linebacker undrafted free agent, Drew White. Now, why would I point out undrafted free agents? First off, because they had an opportunity at the linebacker position, which we have all highlighted as a weakness. They had an opportunity to make the team. They had an opportunity to play significant minutes, significant snaps this season. So losing them, even though their pedigree may be undrafted free agent from that perspective, to me is still important. And we're going to be counted on. Ron yeah. Rivera, when's the last time you had a head coach got to give an entire statement on an undrafted rookie free agent linebacker? Right. Right. Have. That's how thin it is. That's how thin it is. And so that's why my initial answer to a person I'm looking out for is Jamin Davis, not Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz has had some struggles in camp. That's okay. Like, you know who Carson Wentz is. He's gelling with the offense. It's his first year in a new system. That's going to happen. Would you rather that happen now or in the season? So get it out of the way. Keep doing it. Throw more interceptions. I don't care. It's Carson Wentz at the end of the day. I'd rather he try shit now and be a little more conservative come game day and limit those turnovers then be conservative now and then go, I'm Carson fucking Wentz in week one, just bomb it. And it's a pick. Those are the games that matter in September. So go ahead and do what you need to do. But that linebacking core, my goodness, that I'm nervous about. Yeah. And that's been the big thing that we've been the entire off season. That's all we've talked about. We've wanted Landon Collins even to come back. Is he still a free agent? Um, so <laughs> it needs to be addressed, Ron. Like, I, I'm sorry, like, uh, you want to trust the experts. And yeah, these guys get paid by one of just 32 teams to do to make football decisions. I'm in my parents' basement. Like, I get that. But I'm, I'm, I'm like ringing the bells, sounding the alarm about this linebacker thing. And Ron and those guys are like, no, we're going to be okay. We're going to address it. We're going to figure this out. If it goes bad, you're not going to hear me shut up about this. It's oh, it's this. There's shouldn't. no excuse, no excuse. An entire off season to fix it. Uh, and again, Jamin Davis needs to look good. And I think right now, so far, there have been positive reports on Jamin Davis. It just needs to continue. It absolutely needs yeah, to just keep him away from middle linebacker. Simple as that. Simple as that. Um, I also wanted to ask you, K. Dot, because I know you're. It's so weird because I'm constantly injured, but. Is it too soon to have a conversation about Curtis Samuel? No. Because what he about misses, Curtis Samuel? His favorite misses, food? Ice cream plate? <laughs> he's missed most of last season with an injury. He talks about this is the best he's ever felt in July. And now he's once again sidelined. People are talking about ramping up and stuff like that. There's been time, in my opinion, for that ramp up. Is it okay? I'm concerned. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong about this, because I, I felt as though the vibe over the last like week or two has kind of changed on Curtis Samuel. And maybe I'm right. wrong. But initially, I didn't hear anything about he wasn't 100% healthy. It just seemed like he didn't understand the offense properly at first. So they were kind of keeping him on the side. He wasn't doing the same thing as some of the other guys. And now it's sort of morphed into he might not be 100%. Um I might be wrong. I was just like, I, I haven't been to training camp. We probably should go to training camp. I've been just yep. getting my news to whatever in the Twitter feed, right? 
Um, but that's been the vibe that I had, which has made me really concerned about Curtis Samuel and like mm-hmm. where he is as far as in development. But then every once in a while I hear that like, he, I think once or twice I've heard, oh, wow, he looked good doing X there on that. Look, the bottom line goes with Curtis Samuel. And the bottom line goes with any of this. With Curtis Samuel, he has to prove it. That contract that they gave him was a contract that a lot of people were looking at and said, you give him that much to him? This almost feels as though it's just Ron Rivera doing a solid by a Panther, right? Like, it just, <laughs> there, there's criticism that was already baked in. There was a little discrepancy as far as, like, um, did we rush him back too soon last year? Or is he just not as good or not as healthy? Like, let, me, let me interject for a moment just on yeah. that. Did we rush him back too soon? I'm... Look, I don't know Curtis. I hope he is healthy. I hope he's able to have a productive year for us. However, he's been called out by Steve Smith twice. Once when he was with the Panthers and once when he was with the then known Washington football team. The next day after that interview, after missing practice for weeks, he was there. After Steve Smith said he was overpaid and told us, sorry. So is the solution to have Steve Smith on every week so that Curtis Samuel turns into a pro bowler like i don't know it seems to me the optics of that are he takes that shit personally and he actually responds to it so i don't know what's going on because one year fine that happens to players but now we're beginning this year talking about injuries again i'm concerned yeah i'll yeah, say it no, it's it's, it's like proves in the pudding it's when the season starts where is he what is he doing because yeah. right now he's he owes like <laughs> what he did last year compared to that contract he got. He owes. Now I know the wide receiver position after the Jacksonville Jaguars throw a fucking atom bomb into it um, is everybody's getting paid these ridiculous numbers. So maybe the same as though doesn't look as terrible as it did last year. Right. But he's got to perform. And that's where that's we're at true. right now. And the thing is, I there's almost like these built in excuses almost because like everybody's more excited to see Jahan Dotson. They are at Curtis Hamill at this point. Right. But mm-hmm. he's got to contribute, and he has to contribute in a major way, and it has to in a meaningful way for this upcoming season. If he doesn't, it was a terrible move. And I know Mernal Wedge is listening or watching, wherever it may be. It's also on Spotify and iTunes and stuff like that. Um, Cam Sims may get an opportunity here. And whenever he has had an opportunity, he's done reasonably well. I'm pretty sure it's Mernal's favorite player, maybe of all time. Um, Cam Sims Everyone. may well get a... <laughs> get a look <laughs> at the field if this continues. If De'Ami Brown sidelined, if Curtis Samuel sidelined, I mean, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, opportunities, opportunities aplenty on this team. The only other thing I wanted to note is that today there were some reports about Antonio Gibson fumbling again. Um, that is also a tale as old as his career. And so it was nice to, I remember thinking about it, I'm like, Curtis Samuel's hurt. Antonio Gibson's fumbling. Well, two of our three draft picks were running back wide receiver. It's nice to have Brian Robinson Jr. here. It's nice to have Jahan Dodson here. God, I cannot speak today. Um, But that it's nice to have that security blanket for these guys. And they need them because right now, Curtis Samuel needs to prove it to us. Mm -hmm. Antonio Gibson has been one of my most frustrating players. And I've talked about it. He's so talented. He's so talented. And yet he does not understand how big a human being he is and doesn't know how to play it. But I will say this. I saw a couple of clips coming out of training camp of him in a pass blocking. And it gave me Clinton Porter's vibes. Who might be the greatest pass blocking right back. Phenomenal. Also. Yeah. If Gibson runs like he pass block physicality, could be something special. But maybe this is where we're at. Like if you said with the Steve Smith thing, maybe Gibson just needs somebody breathing down his back. Sometimes. He needs to know somebody else is in there willing to take – take. look, you're supposed to be the receiving wide receiver, right? Jaden McKissick back, and he's healthy. Mm-hmm. We got somebody that can run the tackles and Ryan Robinson. You need we to do. prove your worth, sir. <laughs> uh, Curtis Samuel, same thing. Brother, look, that wide receiver room is hefty. So hefty, which Antonio Gandy Golden had to switch to tight end before he got up out of here. Right. You need to, you need to bring it. Otherwise, next guy up. Simple as that. Um, any final thoughts on Commander's training camp before we move on to the comment mailback? Uh, seeing football come on last night is getting really real, man. Uh, it's, it is. It's getting really, really real. And uh, 
Can't wait for training camp to be the fuck over so we can watch some preseason, meaningless preseason games. And uh, which I'll be so excited for. But as you, football is around the corner, and you can just feel it, and it feels so good. And I can't wait for Sundays to mean something again. I mean, Formula One has been great, but it's uh, it's just I'm waiting. For it's time. Sundays around that. It's time. Thank you, Formula One, for what you've done for both of us. Now let's move on. Um, also, just being a Ferrari fan is the worst. Anyway, let's move on to the comment mailbag over here. We got three comments. Sorry, we got three comments over here that we wanted to address. First one's from VA <laughs> Money Group. We are way overrated. Our fanship has turned into the Cowboys. We hype this team every year, but we've won. One playoff game in over 30 years. Uh, we it, The point stands. We've won two, I believe. So we've got the Tampa Bay game where uh, Sean Taylor got ejected. Rest in peace. Um, and Mark Brunel threw for like 60 yards or something like that. that. That might be too high. I remember that being a record for fewest pass yards in a win in a playoff game. And we also beat the Lions in like 1999 or 2000 or something like that. Um, so two wins, but but point stands. We have not been successful in the postseason. That is one. And then, of course, we've got. <laughs> go ahead, K. Dot. I, I wouldn't go as far as to call us Cowboy fans. I will say the difference with us, and this is what you have to go into the psyche of who we are as commanders fans, right? Number one, you have to admit that we are the villains. Whether it be from. Uh, once you realize oh, that, you understand right. that. When you go to the history. Yeah, yeah. You go through the history, we are villains. But then outside of that is that this team has really given us anything to root for. So this is right now at this particular part of the year is the sickness. I call it the sickness of the fandom. Mm. It has to give you a reason to root for the team. It has to give you a reason to be excited. We can't be excited about five and five and uh, what five and 12 is what you could do now. Right. Which right. is what we typically would be under 500. Right. So we have to sell ourselves on some sort of hope. We do. Just know that this is the stage you're in. It's okay. It's a natural progression. It's part of the sickness. I tied for first in the NFC East right now. Tied for first in the NFL right yeah, now. Nobody's so saying we're going. To, we're, Cowboys fans are thinking we're going to Super Bowl. We we're, we're not, not saying that. that right. We right. are not saying that shit. Um, let's shift over to Tony. Shout out Tony. Thank you as always for the comment. And it reads: Thanks guys for another great podcast. Who has the best trio of wide receivers, as well as duo of running backs and tight ends in the division? I actually think that's a very good question. Uh, K dot, do you have a spot answer right now? If not, I can. No, you go first. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a look at some. Okay, so the best trio of wide receivers. I'm going to go AJ Brown, Devonte Smith, and it doesn't matter who. Um, for the Philadelphia Eagles, because those two guys are insanely talented. Um, I was talking to Renal. Shout out Renal again. Um, and uh, Max, another friend of the show, and we were talking about the Washington wide receivers with Curtis Samuel, Jahan Dotson, Terry, Jahan's a rookie, zero NFL snaps as of right now. And Curtis can't stay healthy. So as much as I want it to be them, I can't, I can't say that. Um, duo of running backs and tight ends. Tight ends might also, I'm thinking about it might also be Philadelphia with Dallas Goddard and whoever else they're lining up. Like Philadelphia's talented. There's a reason there's so much noise around those guys. Uh, running backs, I'm going to go ahead and be a homer. Um, wait, no, I can't. I can't because Tony Pollard and Zeke Elliott are pretty damn good down there in Dallas. So maybe we're second with Gibson and uh, Brian Robinson Jr., who, of course, has played zero snaps. And J.D. McKissick is solid, though. So I guess summarizing that, best rear wide receivers, Philadelphia. Duo of tight ends, Philadelphia. Duo of running backs, <laughs> Dallas. But I think Washington's an honorable mention there. k yes. go ahead. Yeah, I think I'm with you. Uh, wide receiver, Gallup is pretty good. Um, but yeah, so it's CD a, Gallup. But... With Amari Cooper was there, it's easy. That's a slam dunk. Amari right. Cooper being gone, they're up there. James Washington. Well, he got hurt. He's out for six to ten weeks here. All right, yeah. So, yeah, fuck off. The Giants <laughs> have spent so much money. There's Tony Gallagher, Stone Shepard. Yep. I do on think paper it's nice. On paper but, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Until Daniel Jones does something, it's it's hard to say them. It's a function yeah. of QB play. So that's the thing is that if I'm looking through these guys, I think the best. This is gonna. I know I'm gonna catch some flack for this. Here we go. I, 
I always Terry McLaurin and AJ Brown are the two guys that are always getting begin compared to each other, right? Same draft. There's a, I numbers. pick Terry over AJ. I I do. I think it's um, fair. So there's that. So I if I'm Devonte Smith against Josh Jahan Dotson, give me Smith right now. But I, I, I like to. have to. Yeah. So I think you got to give the Eagles. But I if I'm looking overall as far as Terry, I'm trying to separate my bias because of Terry compared to who I just think is the most talented receiver in the division, which I think is CeeDee Lamb. Mm-hmm. Um, skinny boy, even though. I, it's hard. He's a I, great route runner. That's the thing. I, it's really, really hard to tell. I do think that we're all sort of in this mix mash and the Giants are below it. Yeah. I, I, well, even the Giants have some talented wide receivers. I think it is that big sort of mishmash. And that's why the NFC East has 17 consecutive seasons of different division winners. Yep. No one's won back to back in 17 years. Like that is actually insane. I think it was the Eagles that did it with Donovan McNabb like three, four years in a row. And after that, it's been a revolving door ever since. So it's and, a great question, Tony. And yep. we appreciate it. And running comment. back is absolutely not us. It, it, unfortunately. It's unfortunately. not. It, we're, we don't have anyone who's going to say Quan Barkley, period. And then right. we don't. And then if you're looking at the Zeke Pollard combo. Zeke Pollard's terrific. Like, I hate do, to say Do it, I but, trade Gibson and McKissick for Saquon Barkley? Yeah, if you can. Certainly. Right. So yeah. gone. I, I That one guy's worth those two guys, right? Yeah. And then Zeke, Paul, Zeke, like the, the Cowboys, if they just understood run with Tony Pollard, they win so many more games. <laughs> and on to the last comment from Blood Clot. I think of sports hosts. I respect Rich Eisen. That's a good call. I also respect that was Rich Eisen. He's great. Well done, Blood Clot. Good. Also, Yacht Bitch. Ha 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 ha. He's exactly right. I think Yacht Bitch, again, is sort of just catching yeah, t shirts. Yeah, no, it's catching some momentum over here, KDOT. I think that was really good. I'm glad we stuck with it, and we're going to continue to stick with it. Hashtag God bitch, man. Spread the word. We want to make T-shirts, but we can't make, like, two T-shirts. for We get, we need people to know about us so we can start really getting, a, getting word out there about it. Man. We need people to get the joke. Yeah, um, we, got, we got to. We, got to. we also bitch, need... We also need people to get this podcast, so please like and subscribe and share it and all that share stuff. Share it. So. Yeah, share District Divided. This was District Divided, a DC sports podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. Once again, I am Amit. That is KDOT. We will see you next Friday, 2 p.m., same as always. Until then, take it easy. So um, I looked for State of Grace. Couldn't find it. Okay. I did find Semi Pro again. Decided to rewatch oh, it. God damn you. So much better than I thought. So much better than I thought. The Jive Turkey scene unbelievable you got to rewatch it i think you need to rewatch it you said you didn't so, even remember that much so hold on so uh <laughs> going through hbo max the other uh-huh. day which sidebar this discovery hbo max thing is giving me nightmares right now it is really fucking with me it, it all these streaming servers about to just turn on the cable again and it's so frustrating it's mm-hmm. so aggravating um Looking for a movie to watch the other the other day, and uh, we were scrolling through HBO Max, and me and the girlfriend, and saw Semi Pro because Semi Pro is streaming on HBO Max, and I I start laughing, and she's like, "Why are you laughing?" I was like, "I for some reason thinks this movie is like a masterpiece." And she's like, "So she looks at the she looks at it, she's like, which one?" And I think she named I forget what movie she named. She named another movie. I was like, "No, Semi Pro." <laughs> she's yeah. like, "What?" I was like, do you remember Semi Pro? She's like, that's the one with Andre 3000, right? I was like, yeah. He thinks it's like this really funny movie. And then she's, we talked for like 15, 20 minutes on why you were wrong about how forgettable of a movie it was. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I had a lot more respect for Devin before we were talking about this. So, you know, instead of watching Semi Pro, because I, I admit, I was like, you just maybe, shat we, on it for 15 maybe minutes. We, should, we should watch it. She's like, no, turn on Free Guy. And we watched Free Guy. Hey, Free Guy wasn't bad. Free Guy, was I was blo- Free Guy having 80% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I know is not a good marker measure of how good we something agree. is. We agree. But 80% was higher than I ever expected that to be. Now, the thing with Free Guy is, as I'm watching Free Guy, I'm like, this movie's dumb as fuck. Completely. I'm having so much fun. Yes. Like, that, that was what Free Guy felt like. It was like, I, no one could ever tell me this was a good movie. It's not. I felt like it was like um, Ready Player One on crack. 
Like that's what it felt like. Like watching that movie. Like it was just the the worst parts that Ready Player One could be with Ryan Reynolds being just charismatic Ryan Reynolds. I mean, the transformation of Ryan Reynolds into just self acceptance and I'm going to bring myself to the big screen. Yep. Thank goodness for that because he used to be in these rom coms and like he almost looked visibly in pain with some of these lines, and then all of a sudden he gets to do Deadpool and. I watched both I, of those. Oh, two everything ago. changed. Now we can agree those are fantastic movies. Those are great. They're they're fucking oh my great. Gosh, so good. I've been watching all the R-rated content on Disney Plus. So I, I watched <laughs> Logan three nights ago, and I did a back to back Deadpool two nights ago. Now um, yeah. I, I have a question. So on Disney Plus, of course, there is R-rated content. Not something you'd necessarily expect to be on something called Disney they Plus. Have to. Of course, they have to. My question is, they don't. They don't like beat bleep anything out, right? Like they hmm. give you the full lines. Terrific. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, may, yeah. I may watch Deadpool. Because that was the thing was like um right now with the way the MCU is going, they're introducing these new characters and it's almost impossible. Like like how are we gonna have conversation about this content and stuff that you own and not have it on the platform? And yeah. I get them so I, I'm actually more surprised they uh I expect them to do something along the lines like what HBO Max or something does, which is like the adult profiles compared to the kid profiles. Maybe there'll be more of that going forward. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the best comic book movies, in my opinion, of all time is Logan. And that was what that was the first one. I've never seen it. Logan is incredible. Um, What it means to the canon as far as X-Men is I... As maybe it all makes sense. I don't think it does, at least compared to like what they were doing with the Michael Fassbender X Men, uh, James McAvoy, the First Class, and then that existing the same universe as the Patrick Stewart stuff. I don't know if that all lines up or gels correctly. I just don't. I don't think the timeline works, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, but Logan is an incredible movie, and it's w- us seeing Wolverine the way that you're supposed to see Wolverine, and that hmm. that to me has always been you have over reused in his claws you don't see any fucking blood is like dumb as shit for how long Hugh Jackman was playing fucking X-Men uh Wolverine Logan does it fucking right okay really does it right it makes you afraid of Patrick Stewart uh Professor exact uh Xavier's powers okay it's a great fucking flick it's so good like it is literally one of the greatest comic book movies of all time so I haven't seen that many of the like X-Men movies or the origin stories, but I remember seeing X-Men first class. I was uh, visiting it's my grandmother in India. Oh, it's amazing. It's I was movie. so glued to it. Um, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, I'll just put it on in the background to sort of see what's going on. I was waiting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Grandma was making amazing dinner. And uh, while we were waiting for that, my sister and I were just like, well, sure, just throw it on. And we, I mean, we had to be dragged away from the TV. That was an amazing movie. I was yeah, not expecting that. Dude, I, I'm all for and I know the MCU is going to introduce the X-Men in the next three to four years. Um, I want, so first class, great movie. Days of Future Past, really, really good. Don't say it's great. Really, really good. Apocalypse is a fucking shit show. Yeah. And I have been too afraid to watch Dark Phoenix. Um, that I just haven't done it because I love the Phoenix character. I love Jean Grey. I I love this cast and stuff, and I just heard so many horrible things about it that I just stayed away. I am gonna watch it eventually, but the, I I want McAvoy and Fassbender back. Mm-hmm. I want I want Fassbender back more than any. He they've done a great job with Magneto um, over the years. As far as uh, McKellen and then Fassbender has been fucking out of this world. So lucky to have both those guys. I don't know if you'll ever have anybody that could top those. I just wish they could figure out Dr. Doom in any sort of level close to that. And then what I'm hearing the rumors for Dr. Doom, Giancarlo Esposito. Yeah. That could be a fucking problem. Like that could, that could be legit. So, so briefly switching gears, um, you know, we're talking about these, uh, oh, I don't know if I call X-Men super. And anyway, if yes. you could have, yeah, if you could have a superpower, any superpower, I'm sure you've had this conversation. People have this conversation all the time. Or at least everyone's had it. What would it be? So that's the, I, there's caveat. I've had this conversation so many fucking times. There you the, go. The, so like a superpower or like, do I, can I pick a superhero and I get all of those powers? Is it more of a mutant thing where it's like, I got I'll one thing. Reign. I'll give you free reign. So I could, so I could pick any superhero and I have their powers. Sure. You just maybe need to describe them to me because I'm not familiar with all the superheroes. Gotcha. Uh, if I could be anybody who would I be? 
I probably, I probably want Captain Marvel's powers, honestly. And what are those powers? For those that don't know, I'm no, obviously. <laughs> she can do anything she wants to do. <laughs> That's a good power. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. She's indestructible. She has so much energy and she can power anything she wants. Uh, Is that Brie Larson's intercept. character? Yeah, Brie Larson's character. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, I mean, there's that. Like, but if, if you're giving me, like, any superhero ever. Captain Marvel, I, I watched a movie day before yesterday, so maybe that's why it's just fresh in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I would try to figure out whether or not Captain Marvel is actually good. I would really try to figure that out. Um, yeah. It's hard, because it's like Superman. I don't think Superman's a, he has superpowers. He's just an alien. Same way I feel about Thor. Oh, dude, have you seen Invincible? The like animated, it's like eight episodes. No, heard it's about based it. Based off the it. comic, I think you'd really like it. I, I've heard good things. I, I think I would like it. I think you would really, really like it. I watched it because a friend recommended it to me, and I was like, "Sure, let's see what it's about." Uh, loved it. Loved I heard it. Looking really, really good two. thing about it. It's on Amazon Prime. I think it's worth checking out. I don't know what made me. Well, I mean, superheroes. <laughs> That's what made me think about it. But um, it, it's an interesting premise. I'm not even gonna say what the premise is but it's it's worth seeing also again because it's eight episodes so it's pretty quick to go through i'm really i'm really trying to figure out which one because I, I really just think it ends up being like overthinking it, it has to just be superman just, mm-hmm. i mean because flight's the machine shit. invisibility is good too though Super i'd be the strength. flash dude the thing is i don't want to be the flash because ezra miller fuck that um, no, the- my, i mean my <laughs> knee fucking sucks i just want to feel fast again it's been well, so thing- long I, I'm looking at what can I do superpower wise that doesn't necessarily give me responsibility. Okay. I don't necessarily want to be a superhero. I just want to have the power and like well, visibility because tr- like no one would really know where you even are. You could just disappear. Yeah, but I probably here's the thing. I know myself and I know most people. I just probably end up being some perverted asshole. Um, like you can't be rich just being invisible. What you're gonna you steal Appreciate the money? You spend the money. That's the thing. It's like all right, I'm invisible. I'm gonna go into a bank, a vault. And like sneak out with the money and nobody's gonna know i still have money that i can't launder like there's a lot of work involved for me to make that money being invisible right right so like flight makes sense because i never have to pay for an airfare again which is dope you do save a lot of money right so like captain marvel's cool because like i want to be able to travel anywhere in the universe or the galaxy like really explore see if there's alien life or something anywhere else that'd be dope and i feel like and I feel like I, I catch w- up with my shows when I'm flying, though. I feel like that's where, like, that's where I started watching Drive to Survive. Was on a flight. You won't be able to do that while you're flying. Why not? While you're flying, you got to make sure you're not hitting airplanes. You're just gonna kill people because you're space? stronger than the airplane. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. Listen, you're murdering people if you're just watching Drive no. to Survive. You look right, up. So, and it's just hold over. on. But here's the thing. It takes you how long to fly to London? Oh, you're talking about like on a plane. About yeah, six on a plane. and a half hours. Six, six, six and a half six. hours. Yeah. If I'm Captain Marvel, I'm in London in what? A few minutes, maybe a minute. Is that how fast minutes? it is? So like if I'm if I'm there, then I get to go to my hotel room and catch up on the shows. Okay, but while if you you're have still power, in your plane. You don't That's my point. Is like I don't need like you could just do whatever you want. Yeah, I could do whatever I wanted to. Yeah, you're you're not gonna watch TV if you have those kinds of powers, I don't think. That's the thing. Like do I want Doctor Strange powers and like have access to the time stone? Because I can just go back in time and do shit. Anyway. But then I'm like, if I'm Doctor Strange, there's going to be people coming from all over and I have to protect people. And I got to do this that, and the other. It becomes a responsibility thing. And I don't want that. Well, I'm thinking more about this now. So follow-up question. If you were a superhero, what would you do with your free time? Right? You have a few minutes that you, you just get to London. You're going to have a lot of free time. Herogasm. All the time. Herogasm. You want to explain that to me? The boys. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing is like I'm looking at these superpowers and I'm also realizing that if it's in real life it's going to be a lot more like the boys in any sort of Marvel fucking show sure um, I haven't seen that either I've heard great things though from you from Renal from a few others yeah if you're a superhero you're just going to be fucking other superheroes and like doing whatever you want to because there's no consequences to your actions like that's kind of where you're at so like part of me says I want Homelander's powers from which is basically Superman's powers Yeah. which is ba- you get to a point where you tell the world like you can't do there are no consequences that exist for me leave mm-hmm. me the fuck alone and give me all the money i am now your emperor <laughs> like that's like there is a certain level of like you reach that level they really just can't do anything to you 
So yeah. it's like, if you touch my family, if you do anything, I'll murder everyone. Right. I, I will, I, I will burn countries to the ground if you fuck with me. Like the world will end if it's up to me. So you have to respect that. There's a certain level that I'm like, yeah, fuck it. I want Superman's powers because I'm going to be the world emperor. That's how it. That's how it's going to go down. Hey, it sounds pretty nice to me. I don't hey, blame you. you. I like, would get hey, it. Hey, hey, was, was, yeah, pretty nice. so, so how would how would I be treated <coughs> knowing that we you know co-host this podcast and now you're world emperor? I'm sorry the podcast ends because I am now the owner. No, that of makes the, sense. That yeah, makes sense. I'm now the owner of the Washington Commanders because uh, Dan Snyder or Yacht Bitch. Um, oh, you could find him instantly. Now, if I say what I do, if I had Homelander's powers to Yacht Bitch, I think we might have some problems. So I'm not going to get into any detail. Yeah, but you could put it together, guys. We might be close. You to could put it together. Up. We might be very, very close to wrapping this up. Emperor of the world. That's that'd be me. Because that's how it's going to go down. And be honest with yourself, people. That's how it would go down. You, if you had these powers, you'd be. Uh, come on, if you knew that nothing ever could fuck with you. You can take anything you want it to take. All right. Well, you know what? I think that's a good place to wrap up the show. Just think about KDOT as emperor of the world and how great or terrible that would be. But we got to run. Talk to you guys later. Really bad. Really bad for some people. Peace and love.